Hi, my name is Sanga Lindsay. I'm a landscape architect in North Vancouver, but today I'm here in sunny Mount Monaco in Europe, and we're standing outside of a contemporary Japanese garden, um, which is located right in the heart of Monaco, right on the water. And we're standing at the outside of the gate, and gates were typical of uh, entry points into a garden and welcoming visitors through this passageway. And the interesting part about this gate is that it has, if you notice on the rooftop, two tiled figures, and those were to ward off evil spirits or evil presences into the garden. So we're going to take a quick look inside and see and talk about and I'll be showing you all the different design principles of this particular Japanese garden. So come on, let's go. We're now inside uh, the entrance of the garden. While this garden is not one particular style, there was many different types of Japanese garden styles depending on what century uh, they were built in. This one would be more reminiscent of what we call a strolling garden. And as you can see, there's a series of pathways that wind through this garden and uh, in the distance they will terminate in a variety of ponds, waterfall features, which we'll talk about when we get there. So let's take a walk down the garden. Our first stop is at this water feature here. It's a series of waterfalls and the Japanese were very much into creating miniature landscapes. So in essence, with the waterfall and the rock compositions, it was supposed to emulate uh, in miniature the idea of large mountains, uh, large waterfall features, and rivers that ran into uh, large water bodies or even ocean sides. This feature here was typical in a Japanese garden, and they would have uh, significance in that they were usually considered, um, they were put there as representations of old stone temples. So we're going to cross the bridge now and we're going to just take a look at some of the other features in this garden. And here we're standing next to a dry garden. This was another type of Japanese garden style. It was typical of the Buddhist monks who created these gardens as places for meditation. And the interesting part is that it might take years to build a garden like this the right rock for its energy and its form would have to be selected and placed with its counterpart, often in a yin-yang scenario. And if you note that the gravel has been raked artistically on the bottom, typically these would represent things like islands and the water that was raked in the gravel would emulate the oceans, the currents of the oceans or the waves of the oceans. So this is the first stopping point before we head to the tea garden. And here we are at another very neat Japanese feature, often found in over water bodies. These bridges here, which are created in a series of zigzags. It's a technique the Japanese use in order to force the person who's walking across the bridge to turn in various directions. That way he would get full and different views of the garden as he turns back and forth across the bridge. And here's another example of a dry gardening technique used in a less formal sense, a less meditative sense. As you can see, we've got the large stone features that border the raked gravel, the raked gravel being the ocean. And in the middle of the gravel, we see uh, rocks jutting out. Oftentimes, they were representative of, of islands, or they could also represent certain elements in nature. And, for example, that one in the middle could represent a tortoise. The tortoises were often used in Japanese garden design. It represented longevity. And as you can see in the far back, we've got a clipped azalea. And clipped azaleas, bockwood, boxwoods were miniature plants that were used, and they were to emulate, it, emulate the forested green hillsides of Japan. See, there's a series, a collection of koi, and koi was considered a sacred fish. They're a prized collector fish as well. And 
it's not uncommon to have someone pay up to one two hundred thousand dollars for the ultimate prize koi. They live an extremely long time and they can get very large. I believe between one and two feet they can ultimately reach and they can live many, many years. Now other elements in this garden are if you look next to the pond, across the pond, the clipped pines. Now the clipped pines are, have been done in a bonsai method or style. That's to keep them dwarf in size. It's to keep everything small. As I said before, all these ponds, rock features, were all to emulate larger features in nature. Rocks were mountains, the clipped pines were the forested trees, koi fish in the ocean, irises in front of the little rock island there were also a common plant used in Japan. And if you swing over to the right, you're swinging over to the right, you can see a series of mortared pebble. And those pebbles were to represent a beach side on the banks. In the far distance, you'll see a building sitting on the water feature, and that building would often be a meditation pavilion. It could be used uh, for ceremonies, for gathering spots, or for contemplation. Our last stop before the tea house was that the visitor would stop at this water basin and the water basin was deliberately cut to be low and small and it, what it would do is it would cause the visitor to lean over invoking this sense of humbleness before he entered the tea house. So oftentimes these basins were fed through uh, a, a creek up that was tapped in via a bamboo pipe that fed this uh, water basin and you could anoint yourself or take a drink but the whole idea was to invoke the sense of bending over and humbleness because of the height of the basin and then as the visitor leaves the basin this is when he enters into the tea house and in this case there would be an entrance over here again the door would be quite low causing the visitor to bend low again being very humble before entering into the building to uh, conduct the tea ceremony. And as our final stopping point, I'd like to point out to you this red bridge. Red is my favorite color and not for an unknown reason. In Japan, red was a common color. It meant power, it meant grounding or success. And so you will often see red painted on certain fixtures on a building. Red bridges were very common. And from a designer point of view, perfect accent point in a garden with green. So I hope you enjoy your little tour. And if you want any more information on gardens, garden design styles, please visit my website at sangadesigns.com. See you next time.